Welcome back to another episode of Practice Underwater. We're here with part two of our interview with our fake doctor, Brittany. And uh, Matt, can you give our audience just a little bit of a rundown of this practice, you know, everything like that, sort of all the things that we have dealing with right now? Sure. Yeah. Brittany and her sister bought a perio office uh, two months ago. They're GPs. It's a six-op office, one hygienist, open four days a week, uh, did about $1.2 million pre-COVID. Um, last, their first two months, they did about 100 k in revenue. Um, but really, um, we talked about some mindset issues last time, some scarcity that's coming through, um, you know, some worrying about expenses every month and this feeling like this practice is a burden. Um, so this, this episode now is, is with the interview with Suzanne is, is real tactical, um, really getting into the numbers on DI and, and seeing where the opportunities are to kind of turn this ship around. Um, cause the, these two docs have, have dreams of making it more of a family practice rather than kind of this small perio referral office that they have now. Um, so this is, this is a really good one as far as here and, you know, how we can get that, that path started. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, we talked a lot in part one. If, you, if you're interested in this interview at all, you know, part one was great in that we talked about so much about their decision to buy a perio office as GPs unable to replicate the procedures. I don't see the need to beat the dead horse and talk about it again. But if you're interested, go back to part one and listen to them talking about, you know, their decision to buy the office. And Matt, I think we had some thoughts. Would you would you describe intro outros as uh, we had some honest thoughts on that decision? Yeah, some thoughts. They, they weren't a. Uh, we weren't I don't think we were. Anything. I don't think we were too mean or anything no. like that. I, th- I thought we had honest thoughts. Yeah. Um, calm yet honest. Yeah, that's what I'm going for. I, I, we tend to get riled up, and we don't want to, you know, make a guest feel uncomfortable or listen to it back or whatever. Like we want to be very authentic yet. You know, compassion. Is yeah, the person I right think now. respectful yet authentic is sort of what we're going to try to go for on these. Yep. So anyway, um, I'm really excited for today's episode. Suzanne's going to take it away here. So without further ado, here is part two with our f- fake name, real doc, Brittany. Welcome back to another episode of Practice Underwater. And today, I this is part two of um, our episode with Brittany. Brittany, welcome back to Practice Underwater. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. So why don't we start off today by giving the audience a little bit of um, a recap from last week. Sure. So tell us about the practice again, if you would, and to kind of refresh our memories. Yeah, um, my sister and I purchased this practice at the end of February, so it's been almost two months now, um, and it was a perio practice, and we're two general dentists. Okay, excellent. And you said uh, last week you had, so you each work two days currently, Mm -hmm. um, and you have four days of hygiene, one and a half front office, and almost two assistants. Is that right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so essentially the two of you are um, sharing two days each for a full four day, four doctor days. And then ideally you'd like to um, add on an extra day each, right? Yes. Eventually. Okay. And then um, the practice is open Monday through Thursday? Yes. Okay. Um, so numbers wise, um, and you just took over the practice two months ago. So numbers wise, we were doing, um, the seller was doing 1.25. Uh, it looks like we are on target. If we just use Q1 here as a benchmark, um, probably at 1.1. Um, and then from a, let's see, from a patient-based standpoint, we haven't necessarily talked about that. Tell me what your thoughts are on um, approximate active patients. Um, I think we were told when we purchased, she had about maybe 600 or so active patients, um, but it's looking like um, there's less, maybe three or 400 active patients seeing hygiene right now. She was doing a lot of implants because she was perio. So I feel like a lot of patients would come in for an implant consultation and they wouldn't come back. Um, So I'm not sure if the numbers are accurate. Now, do you or your sister or both do implants? We restore implants right now, um, but we did hire a periodontist to come in um, every so often to place implants. And we are definitely looking 
into more training so that we can place at least some simple implants ourselves, um, especially with this type of practice. We think it would help. Mm -hmm. For sure. So to kind of dive into the numbers, um, we have on the active patient side, it looks like we have 500 patients, so 501. And on the how many of those have been seen in hygiene, we have 400. Okay. So, so, and this is seen in the last 18 months. So I recognize that you and your sister just took over in February. Um, and, you know, this brings to mind, there's a hundred patients that were seen so at, within the last 18 months in the practice, but a, those hundred are not necessarily in our hygiene program. So I know you and your sister are really going to work on making sure that everybody um, you know, is seen and, and becomes part of the hygiene program, right? Mm -hmm. um, the concern I have when I look at this is how many of those 400 patients are actually scheduled ahead in the future. So whether it wasn't something the seller and her team were doing in the past, um, that's something you and your sister will really have to focus on and get the team really on board with scheduling ahead. We have 400 active patients, like I said, that have been seen in hygiene, but 56% of those are actually pre-appointed for their next oh. appointment. Okay? okay. So the flip side of that is we've got 44 patients, 44% um, of the patients that don't have an appointment that are in limbo out there. Could it be that um, we've had quite a few patients. Uh, we sent a letter from uh, the seller um, talking about us taking over and we've had quite mm -hmm. a few patients, I guess, inactivate um, or tell us that they were going to go elsewhere. And so I'm wondering if um, that would be a large percentage of those patients. Is there any way to find that out? So when I look at dental intel in the recare area, um, we have some patients that were seen. So we have 97 patients that were seen in the last six months that are not scheduled ahead. Mm -hmm. We have in different groups. And I would say the largest group, of course, is your patients that either were manually inactivated by the practice or they just fell off the, the 18 month mark. So they're 18 months plus one day overdue, basically. Um, that pool of patients is, is quite large, I would say. If the team inactivates the the patient because they say they're not going to be here, then it goes into that sort of large category of patients that were seen um, in the last 18 months, but have been inactivated or patients that have just fallen off because they're more than 18 months overdue. But we do have, we do have 250 patients that are not scheduled at all. So you two purchased a patient base, right? I would yeah. say, let's make sure that we have a team member assigned to um, reactivation. And I'm going to talk about pro proactive approach to this and a reactive approach to this. So proactively, what you and the team, you, your sister and the team are going to do is make sure that everybody leaves the practice with their next appointment scheduled in the future. And uh, if you heard uh, the podcast I did on Coach's Corner with, with Caitlin, our coach, we talked about the importance of value, right? Having the hygienist build value, having you, the doctor, build value for that next appointment so the patients absolutely know why they're coming in in six months. Okay, so proactively, we're going to work on that. Um, on the reactive side, we need someone up front between the one and a half front office team members uh, do you have someone in mind that would be a great fit for this? Um, to call patients to schedule? Yes. Um, I believe so. So one of the front desk members, um, she was hired by the seller, I guess, a month before closing. And she does not have dental experience. So we've been trying to, I guess, print out like unscheduled treatment lists or recare lists um, to call patients. Uh, and we kind of assigned that to her, but she is also checking in and out patients. Are you saying we should just only have her calling patients and not checking in and out? 
So she can be checking in and out, but I'm going to suggest what I call power hours. Okay. So you're going to get that team member to step away from the front desk and have power time where she's, if that's a 90 minute time frame, if that's a two hour a day time frame, whatever that is that that you recognize that's available for her. And that could be half a day if you want. You need to make sure someone um, is sitting in that front spot instead of her. I would pull her away and have a minimum number or minimum number of calls done every day where she's able to reconnect with some of these patients. And I will say time is of the essence here because again, you purchased a patient base and the longer they go out with us not connecting, then especially with a new doctor, they got a letter that says there's a new doctor. That could be a great jumping off point for them. Okay. Okay. So, so the, as soon as we can, the sooner, the better, let's, let's get that person. Sounds like if she's a great bubbly person on the phone and she's a great communicator, then, you know, dental experience for reactivation doesn't always have to have dental experience in that position. I just say somebody that's great on the phone and that believes in what you're doing and can speak highly, can get people scheduled, that's the type of person you're looking for. So if she's, is she the part-time person? No, she is the full-time person. Um, the part, okay. I would prefer the part-time, part-time person to be on this task since she's been with the practice longer and um, she kind of knows how to speak to patients a little bit better to get them scheduled or um, get them reactivated, I guess, in a sense. Okay. But we only have her two days a week. Okay. I would, so while I do see that that would be of benefit, again, think about this has to get done sooner rather than later. Maybe the hygienist, if she doesn't have anyone in the schedule, can help with this. Um, Dental Intel or the software reports can help you really hone in on the list and then um, following up with these patients two weeks later, let's give them a call if they haven't called the practice back. But um, as we talk about what I saw on the uh, case acceptance and uh, treatment acceptance area, we can come back to that discussion in terms of who you feel is going to be the best fit for that role. Okay. Okay. So we talked about, just to kind of recap, we said proactive retention, reactive retention, every body for you two really counts, really counts. And if we're going to talk about marketing, this this should be in place because adding new patients to the practice without a strategy on how we're going to keep them in the practice is really just going to have you guys seeing more mouths for the first time, but maybe they don't continue as part of your hygiene program. Okay. So if you're looking at building and not just seeing a bunch of new patients, it will be important to have a system like this in place where the team is paying attention to everyone that walks out the door. And there's a next step for everybody that walks in. Okay. Okay. Now on the switching gears here a little bit to the, um, to the doctor side of things. Now, when I look at the restorative side and the average diagnosis that is, uh, that is being done per exam that you and your sister are doing, this is pretty high. I mean, I, am not, I don't have a problem with the average that you're presenting in terms of exams. It fluctuates between 1,000 to 1,800 per exam. So that's on the high side. Like, you guys are recommending the dentistry where I see an opportunity here is to actually close the gap on how much dentistry is being accepted. Okay. So on the, again, on the diagnosis side, we're good on the acceptance side on the treatment acceptance part, we have 18% of the treatment that's being recommended being accepted. Okay. 
And then on the patient acceptance side, so I'll just kind of explain the difference between the two. Patient acceptance is being measured as I recommended treatment to that patient, that patient said yes or no. So that's, it's a body saying yes or no. On the treatment acceptance side, that is the a dollar value. So you presented as an example so far this month, $130,000 worth of dentistry. And oh, however, only 24,000 of it got accepted. So they scheduled, your patient scheduled for something. So I'd like to see the patient acceptance and the treatment acceptance a little on the higher side, which brings me to, I'll circle back to the conversation we were having about who you think is the best fit here for this. So we've got a part-time person that is um, that understands the practice more and that is in a role where she could impact more dentistry or more patients to say yes. Mm-hmm. And then we've got someone on the full-time side who really doesn't have the, the know-how yet to actually do that. So who does your treatment plans right now? Um, I guess it's the RDA that I work with. Um, they'll usually present the treatment plan and then they'll just tell the front desk what they're coming in for next. Okay. So if we were going to talk about all the things that lead up to a patient ultimately saying yes to your recommendations, um, what would those things be? You know, your, I kind of want you mentally to be thinking about, okay, how are we doing at like on the doctor's presentation on that side? You know, are you both building a sense of urgency for patients as you deliver your recommendations? Is there a sense of urgency? Is there a time frame for when you want to see them back? If not, then I would recommend Let's make sure that's implemented. Are you using intraoral cameras? Do you have intraoral cameras in the practice? Yes. Okay, awesome. So you're using intraoral cameras. Um, co-diagnosing with your hygienist. Yes. How does the, the hygienist also, um, you know, add value to your recommendations once you scoot out and you're now gone to your patient? How is that handoff? from the hygienist to the front. So when it's the hygienist and there's treatment coming out of the hygiene chair, who's doing the treatment plan? Um, the hygienist was doing the treatment plan, but I, I think we need to work on, um, I guess, the presentation after the hygienist. Maybe it's not as consistent if they're coming from the hygiene chair. Okay. I feel that you need a strong treatment coordinator, someone that's an awesome communicator you know, passionate about the dentistry that you're recommending, that you provide someone that has an ease and an understanding and can communicate this. What we've been doing hasn't necessarily been producing the results you're looking for when it comes to filling the doctor's schedule. Okay. So, so I would say you need someone strong up there. And now if we only have that person there part time, and you both are there four days. I would say someone strong up there is needed four days. Now, I know, you know, your mind is going to, oh, we were cutting and we weren't adding. I mean, let's let's just look at this from a purely number standpoint. If your treatment coordinate, coordinator was able to, on the two days she was there, actually close Again, you're you guys are diagnosing a lot of dentistry. So if she was able to close, you know, two more cases or one of the cases a day, she would pay for herself and then some. Yeah, the treatment uh, we, that we actually want her there four days a week, um, but she was on maternity leave and she's only wanted to come back two days a week. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've definitely offered her to come back full time because we recognize that we need someone stronger up front. Okay, and we were good. hoping that she would train the new front desk person as well on, you know, what to say to patients or how to schedule them. So we've been working on not scripts per se, but 
how to speak with patients and how to get them to schedule or if they're calling to cancel or inactivate, like what to say and see if they'll think about reactivating in the future, things like that. Um, but we definitely want her there, you know, four days. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, so what, what do we do? How do we entice her to be there four days <laughs> or, or at least um, have her schedule again, devoted time, like in the schedule where she can do some training. And that does take a little bit of time. So if that person is able, if the, if our full-time person is able to shadow the part-time person, every time she's doing a treatment plan, and then any time that's available, then, and, and we have that, you know, scheduled time also where they're role-playing. I know you, you brought up script and that seems to be for whatever reason, not a very comfortable word for people. Um, but I want to kind of dispel a myth also for our audience Um, having scripts doesn't mean you're pretending to sound like me or pretending to sound like someone else. The script actually has some great, important words that we're going to use that someone can make their own, but at least they have a place to start and at least they know what are the important words, right? So I would say, don't be shy to actually like pull out a script and kind of highlight the words that are the for sure non-negotiable words that have to be, you know, things that convey value or words that really convey a message. And then um, that person will learn what are those important words. And and this is like a practice makes perfect type thing, right? The more she practices, the better she'll get. So the shadowing and the scheduling time, we always think we're going to have time to train. And if you only have this great person there two days a week, I bet she's from the time she gets there to the time she's leaving, I bet she's totally busy. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to take care of the things, you know, of that she should be taking care of four days into two days, right? That's kind yeah. of what, yeah, yeah. So so I would say if that's the case, then let's schedule. I mean, I don't know. Can she come in like two hours on a day where she's not necessarily working, some additional time to to schedule some training? I think you guys should work that out to uh, get your full-time person up to speed sooner rather than later. Because it does would take you, time. Uh, would you suggest like a third party, like front office rocks or things I've heard about? Um, would you suggest anything like that if we can't get her to come in more hours to train? I would suggest shared practices coaching if you ask me. <laughs> oh, okay. so, so shared practices does coaching for front desk staff as well as the director of coaching for our amazing coaching department there is no way I could say look elsewhere right <laughs> 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 we, our coaches would be f- a fabulous resource for you and your sister on absolutely uh training the scripts training the, the talking about the financial options, which is another point on this list is, um, you know, how, what are, what are the financial options that you're offering in, in the practice? Uh, who's doing follow-up? How is that done? What specifically are we saying on these calls? Uh, we talked about the reactivation as well. You know, what is, how are we leaving a message? What are we saying when we leave that message and how do we as a company get probably between 20 and 25% of patients to call us back when in our world today, that's a pretty hard task. You know, everybody feels like they're leaving messages. Um, So I don't want this to sound like a commercial, but I kind of want it to sound like a commercial (laughs) because I I do believe in our coaches and what we do and how, you know, what we deliver. Okay. Okay. Um, So the aside here that I had a minute ago was on financial options. So tell me a little bit about that. How, if I'm a patient in your practice, um, how do I pay? Um, so we definitely have our merchant services. So credit card, cash check, uh, we have care credit, um, and we've kept the in office membership plan that the seller had through Illumitrack. Okay. So again, this is another area where I would dig in and, and kind of perhaps ask 
Um, what are the objections that we get from our patients? Are our patients saying, well, I, I can't, you know, I can't do that. I can't qualify for care credit. Is there an opportunity for you and your sister to sit down and say, okay, can we offer a little bit, um, you know, leeway here? Are we open to uh, more financial options? Like can patients pay us directly? what's the hiccup? And we want to reduce the barrier to entry. So you've got those regular uh, options, financial options, and then you have care credit, of course, like you said, um, membership plan, that's great. And then maybe opening up to, you know, what other options? Is there a six month or a 12 month window that patients can get the work done? Okay. Okay. And then the the last thing that also weighs into the total case acceptance, whether that's treatment or, or patient acceptance, is just follow-up. So if we have this two-day-a-week person doing treatment plans, it's unlikely that she has time for follow-up. So I feel like that is definitely where the ball gets dropped to. If I don't say yes immediately and I say something like, oh, let me speak to my husband about this and I walk out the door... Um, is there someone that's calling me pretty quick, you know, within, and you're, you may think this is a little bit aggressive, but within two days of the treatment being recommended, two to three days later, we're on the phone with the patient figuring out because, you know, if I was really going to speak to my husband, chances are, I probably did that that day or the next day. Otherwise it's out of sight, out of mind. Oh, Okay. Okay, so we need some of these processes at the front to be in place, and we need them in place sooner rather than later, so that when you do add your reactivated patients that need some dentistry, and when you do add new patients to the practice that will need to be, um, we'll need to make sure they're reappointed in hygiene or that they have treatment and we're recommending treatment, we definitely have the strategy in place to make sure no one slips through the cracks in the future. Okay. Yeah. That's a lot sooner than I was um, thinking we had to call. So that's good to know. Mm -hmm. And like I said earlier, you've got that window of opportunity here. The longer it goes out that you don't connect with me and I'm overdue and you're a new doctor, there's a greater chance that I have looked elsewhere or that I'm kind of just in limbo, but I'm not motivated to come in because nobody really gave me a call. Okay. Okay. Now, um, we talked earlier about this proactive uh, approach, right? And I, while I do see in the past, like if I look at the historical data, it wasn't something that was top of mind to get these patients scheduled ahead. I'm, I'm happy to see that in April, it looks like the team is doing much better with appointing ahead. But if I just look at the average, it has been probably 60 to 70 percent historically. Um, so that, you know, the team may need to understand why. Why is it that you are uh, really adamant about making sure everybody is appointed ahead and appointed ahead with value? OK, so the hygienist really does play a large role in that. And so this is a sit down meeting with your hygienist to make sure the three of you, you, your sister and the hygienist, and then, you know, anybody else that's involved in making sure that a patient is appointed ahead, like your assistants, for example, if you've got someone sitting in your chair that doesn't have an appointment scheduled in hygiene in the future, then let's make sure that your hygien your assistants know that that's their responsibility to get it done. Like this is what all of you are going to have top of mind going forward from now on. Okay. Okay. Um, and then another question that's unique to this practice being an old perio practice. Um, some patients do already have another general dentist and we kind of flag those patients. And so sometimes they're coming to see our hygienist, um, and then they they go back to their general dentist. So sometimes that's a little hard to uh, remember, even if they have some work already treatment plan. They're like, oh, I'll go back to my other dentist to do that. 
Mm -hmm. So I would say the patient base may not know at this point that this is a GP practice. Like they know there's new doctors, but I think your marketing will help you. And in everybody's languaging, like I, I get that. So you're not looking for referrals, right? You're not a perio office. So you really don't care if you keep this patient or not. Right. I mean, it's not like you're cutting yourself off at the foot. Right. So if your team is saying, um, Mrs. Jones, I don't know if you're aware of this, but our doctors also like they're not periodontists. They are general practitioners and we can offer this um, service here in our practice as well. We have, you know, our, our, our practice is now a general practice that sees everyone. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. So at least just planting the seed in the patient's mind. Um, there's no reason why they should go to their general dentist because they can do everything in your practice. Yes. And some patients have definitely, um, you know, voiced that they were really happy about that. They can, they can just go to one place now. Um, mm-hmm. but some patients do have some pushback, um, but we have been telling patients we're general dentists. And our hygienist has been very good about explaining that to every patient that she sees. Awesome. So I I do believe that your marketing also will help that. Like, okay. Of course, on the new patient side, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So uh, I'm, we were talking about the unscheduled and, you know, all of that area. I mean, if we just look at the net loss or the net gain, um, in dental Intel and how we're getting new, but losing some of them, which I know you mentioned earlier that some of them are deciding to not continue with the practice for whatever reason. Um, we're at a point where if all we do is add the new patients and have less that we're losing because we are recapturing them we are on a path to growing the patient base. Right now, we show negative growth, right? So just just remaining as is and, you know, kind of going forward, you can expect that you'll be at the negative number pretty soon by the end of the year. That could look like sort of 100 patients, you know, if I look at what this negative number is here. Um, So because your patient base is small already, I say, again, everybody is so important to you that I would really focus on what their next step is. And I would, I would make sure that if the patient has to see you on your side, like, okay, we are, we're getting more patients to say yes to your recommendations. You're seeing them on your side. The patient leaves with two appointments for sure. They leave with an appointment to see you and they leave with an appointment to see the hygienist. It's not Oh, when you come back, we'll give you your next appointment in hygiene. Like hygiene is the priority. That's the only way for you to retain this patient and for this recurring revenue to occur. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Do you have any questions of anything we may not have talked about? Um, I don't think so. I, I think I have a list of things that I need to do, you know, ASAP. Um, Actually, to go back to our marketing um, conversation here, I also want to say when I look at uh, reviews online, we don't have very many. You mentioned an older website, you know, very few reviews. Let's get that in place ASAP. So let's add that to the list you and your sister are going to be taking care of. You need Swell. Yes. Yes. Um, Now that I've been listening to the podcast, I really wish I listened to the podcast before we purchased, then we would have hopefully had all this in place beforehand, but um, I'm definitely planning on getting swell. Excellent. So we need to increase those reviews for sure. And, you know, let's keep in mind, I mean, when you're looking at new patient flow, which is why I keep coming back to our existing patients, you know, these are things you can't necessarily control, right? You put it out there, you add Google AdWords, you know, it's, this is somewhat out of your control. Um, so it'll take some time to grow that, which means internal and external marketing is really important. Does your team feel comfortable about the conversations? Like maybe we're implementing a referral program 
And so the team says, hey, patient, you know, have you heard about our referral program, our thank you program, or something like that, our referral appreciation program? You know, that's a great way to start that conversation, but the team will have to talk this up. So I feel like in tandem, if we're going to uh, spend some money on marketing, then I think internally as well, you really should look at the team at least talking to two to three patients a day, every team member. And that increases the chances that we're also going to um, get new patients internally, maybe implement a program as well, like I said. So would a program, um, would that include um, like a prize or something for referrals? I wasn't sure that was allowed. Mm -hmm. You could do, you definitely could do um, a, an internal drawing and uh, that's something that's in the office. So you wouldn't necessarily publicize that out. I know California has some pretty strict laws when it comes to um, what can and can't be done marketing wise. But um, keep in mind, you can discuss, you can have a drawing, discuss this with your patients that are coming in for the day. And then your referral appreciation program could be every time you actually receive an internal referral, maybe you're sending out a gift card. Okay. As a, as a thank you to the referral source. And then when the team is taking, doing the new patient intake, you know, when they say, who can we thank for referring you to our office or who can we thank for sending you to our office? Um, immediately when, when the patient is hearing that they're already getting the sense of, oh, they thank people. Right. So you're mm-hmm. already starting off that conversation from the get go. So elevating these conversations to a place where this is a focus for the team members, both on the internal side, and then what do we do when the phone rings and, you know, we have someone new on the phone, how that excitement is presented, how the patient is already excited about meeting the two of you before they even get there. Okay. Awesome. Any other questions for me? I think that's all I can think of right now. It was a pleasure having you on our show. I can't wait to hear as, you know, as we follow up, I'd like to kind of get maybe you and your sister back on our podcast in the future to um, talk about all of the things you did implement and, and how those tips and tricks really made a difference. Yeah, that would be great. Awesome. Well, thank you again for being on our show. This is another episode of Practice Underwater. Look forward to seeing everybody next week. Thank you. Welcome back to the outro. Matt, what'd you think of the interview? I very much enjoyed it. I, there was one piece I think we have to address first, though. This is this is the Matt got annoyed with some part of the episode, so we got to get out of the way so we can focus on the... Yeah, this is yeah, becoming I mean, a routine now. It is routine. And listeners, if you need to like tune it out for like the next two minutes, go for it and come back. It's all good. Um, or hit the you know, skip up skip button. Yeah, 30 um, second skip, guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, no, one thing I wish I could skip me, this. Yeah, no, you're not going anywhere. Uh, <laughs> that they said they, they, they don't do implants, but they're thinking about adding it. Now, now let's, let's break that down a bit. They bought a perio office doing a fair amount of implants, most likely. Um, but yeah, specialists. So, like, not just regular implants, like challenging implant cases. Yeah, yeah, like as well. all, all kinds of implants. Yeah. And they're thinking about adding just the easy ones. And they made sure to point out that they're not going to be doing anything crazy, just like the ones that, you know, you know, everyone knows big fat ridge, you know, plenty of bone, IAN's way far away, the whole deal. Yeah. Um, so, we need to break down how, how easy it is to add implants to a, to a GP office. And this is one of the, you know, great things I think that has come out in the last five, 10 years of how easy it actually is. Um, so, what's, what's really needed? Well, I would say, my opinion, one solid implant course. You all know the names, you know, where you're doing hands-on and didactic training. That's a prerequisite. Then the implant kit, the stuff to do it. And probably a CBCT, although you can get away without it for a bit. No. That's for- CBCT. Okay. I New mean, placer, CBCT and guide. Sure. I did my first freehand without, but you can do it anyway. Um, so so what, what are we at here as far as investment? Uh, 20K, maybe? Maybe a little more. So I would say oh, 20K plus maybe the CBCT. 30K up front and then the 45 to 50, 60K uh, for the loan. Paid off the CBCT, loan. Yeah. Yeah. So, that, so that, that's all we're talking. Like yeah. the three to six day course, you know, buying some things, you know, financing a loan. And then they're bringing it into it already peri office, whereas there is a need for the patients expect to have it here. And then obviously the revenue potential, you know, I'll have to tell anyone about. Extremely so, easy, I think. 
So I, I find two things I want to talk about. One, I'm going to notate the same thing you notated. They're thinking about thinking. doing it. But yeah. the but the, the straightforward ones. Yeah, thinking about the potential of adding the straightforward ones. Like this mm -hmm. shouldn't be a this should be a we have to add as many yes. inputs as possible to this practice to replicate production because we mm -hmm. bought a perio practice. Okay. Mm -hmm. That I think we've identified that. The second piece I want to give is there's this tidbit I had every time I added a clinical procedure. Um, this is why I I stopped you and I said no CBCT is a must. Mm -hmm. The reason is when you have proper technology, you can plan your cases very thoroughly before you ever do them. So you can plan with like, I, I look, we can talk guided and guided all that, but I think it, at beginners, it's a lot easier to get the learning curve with a guide initially. And then, and then you can do stuff unguided when you have the surgical skills through the reps, but having the guide for me, when I picked up implants, having everything be guided allowed me to sit in the room with the patient. And if they asked me, could you do it? I would say, absolutely. Knowing that, if I can't design the guide, then I can't do it. And I'll call the patient in a rare later. situation. Mm -hmm. I'll call them and I'll tell them, hey, something came up when we looked at your scan. When I looked at the clinically, it looked like there was, it looked like we had enough ridge. But when we looked at the scan, there's just this little undercut in your bone. And for whatever reason, we can't do the implant. I'll send you to the specialist. We'll make sure you get taken care of. I'll give you back your, your little, uh, we do an implant deposit when, mm -hmm. they, when they do this. I'll give you back the little deposit. Go to the specialist and he'll take care of you. Maybe one out of 20 times that happens. But 19 out of 20 times, the patient feels very confident in your ability to do the procedure because you project the confidence. Same thing with Invisalign. All these procedures have a planning stop before delivering treatment. So you can position it to the patient. When you have these planning resources in your treatment protocols, you can actually position to the patient that you're a lot more confident with the procedure than you may actually be um, newly starting out. Because you have resources and backup and help and support that will tell you when you're in a dangerous area. So this is something, this is how I was felt. This is how I started talking to patients about implants and Invisalign confidently, even though I hadn't yet had enough reps to feel as confident as I sounded. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, that, that was great. And uh, yeah, the, the, I love how you put the confidence comes out. Like you have, yeah. you've, you, it's all digitally planned out. You know, it's super safe. You know, the steps like, and then you can portray that to the patient and more likely yeah. to get a yes. I think the guide, the biggest thing the guide did for me was made me very confident selling treatment, knowing I could deliver on it. If I had a guide and I planned it with, you know, whatever guide company I used to design the implants exactly where I wanted them to go, I knew I could deliver that result for that patient because I had proper planning and I knew I had the surgical skills. So that, that type of thing I think is very important to lean on digital dentistry to make you more confident in presenting treatment to patients, that your case acceptance will go up. So that I'm happy we talked about. The one thing that actually stuck out to me is <clears throat> I'm going to keep talking about this metric because when we switched to dental intel, we sort of switched metrics. Mm -hmm. And people, I think people thought we were a practice by numbers company. Like we're a company that understands practice by numbers. And I want to like strip all of, let's, let's, let's just like, let's think of it this way. We're a basketball team and we wear Nike. Now, we used to wear Adidas. They're shoes. They're a vehicle for us to do what we do. But our company is built on the concept of looking at an entire dental practice, completely objective, entirely data-driven. The specific types of data we use, it's just a tool for us. It's shoes. It's the game that we're playing or the, you know, the training that we have our coaches. That's the real you know, philosophy. And so one of the switches we made was in our old company, we used what we called you know, recare current which was the percentage of patients who in the last six months have received a cleaning. What we're using with Dental Intel is a much more accurate projection, which is called um, pre-appointment, hygiene pre-appointment percentage, which means of an entire patient base, what percentage of your patients are scheduled for their next cleaning in the next six months, knowing that most of them are going to show up for that appointment. So in this case, 56% of this practice is like, this is a perio practice with practically no patients. We've got like 500 active patients. Mm-hmm. And half of them don't even have their next cleaning scheduled. So really, you got like 300 patients tops that you really got. Mm -hmm. The other 200 are just kind of there. You can see why <laughs> she wants to cut hours. Yeah. I mean, I get it, right? But the play of cutting hours is a scarcity mindset we talked about last time. Mm -hmm. But what you could do, which is Suzanne's suggesting, is really talking about implementing some strategies to reactivate overdue recare. And this is where that conversation happened with the whole front office rocks and working with the front desk and that whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And this is not something that we had we had planned to talk about. You know, she, she brought up the front office rocks, and Suzanne let let her know that you know our coaching now is able to train front desk. You know, former office manager coaches uh, di- like uh, having calls directly with the front desk of the office, and that's where we kind of go over these these scripts that Suzanne talked about and the actual verbiage to use, and you know how we are able to get that twenty to twenty five percent reactivation of people we're calling. When I, I know before I use these strategies myself, five uh, percent about patients I would call that would actually come back. You yeah, know, extremely hard to reactivate patients. You know, after they left your office, the proactive um, and reactive approach. I mean, getting all of them on the proactive retention is makes such a big difference in the practice. Yeah, it just you know it takes a while for you to see that the result of that. You know, it takes, yeah, you know, months, six to nine to, months exactly. To see that pro- proactive. So Suzanne, when we made the switch, right? Every time we've made a switch. We made two switches that are very similar. We made the switch in our coaching department to go from Matt and I coaching to our coaches and Suzanne leading our coaches coaching. And then we also made the switch on the show, the same switch of having Matt and I go from recording to Suzanne recording. And the parallels are the same. She talks about handoffs a lot. And Matt and I, Matt, how many times have we talked about handoffs in the year and a half that we recorded Practice Underwater before Suzanne started? Um, not once. And we also never talked about power hours. We're not something we discussed. No. Suzanne talks about a lot of these things. She also talks about this concept called building value. Mm-hmm. So what Suzanne was able to do is I was able to give her analytics-based practice management the philosophy. She was then able to marry that with her vast experience working with teams because ultimately, at the end of the day, we were coaching the dentist. The dentist cannot directly impact analytics the same way the team can. Who's reappointing? The team. Who's converting treatment? The team. Who's calling overdue recare? The team. Who's re- actually retaining patients? The team. What is the dentist doing? Yeah. Diagnosing, producing. That's it. Every other function is done by the team. So we made the switch to talk to the team and you start seeing it through. Suzanne talks about building value, building value for the next visit. That's what Suzanne talks about. That's what she talks to the team about. That's what she teaches the team to do. What analytic does that improve? Your pre-appointment rate in hygiene, your reappointment rate in hygiene, your proactive retention, your overall retention, the growth of your practice long-term. All of those things happen from training your hygienist how to build value for that next visit. That's the switch we made. That's why you're seeing our tone change from training the doctor on their mindset to training the team on their mindset and getting them to perform. Because if we can get the team to perform, we can get the practice to perform and grow. And it takes, honestly, it it, it creates a more predictable results for us as a company because we're taking it out of the client's hands and we're putting it in our hands directly with the team. And we're making sure that we're getting results. So um, I wanted to highlight that distinction for our audience. So I want everyone to see how Suzanne's sort of like maybe consulty type way of talking about handoffs, building value, all of these things, how that impacts analytics and how we pick the strategies very carefully based on our overarching philosophy and that practices goals. And we work with the team to actually make sure that the analytics in each of those categories improve so that we can actually get growth. That's how our process works now with our coaching department. And that's why the front office training that they do is so important because now we can do insurance verification. We can do overdue recare. We can actually implement and execute strategies effectively so we get results. Because the biggest thing is, like Matt and you and I know, we don't want to put our name on a practice and not get results. That would really annoy me. No, it, it, it changes the coaching conversation that Suzanne or the coaching department, uh, other coaches are able to have with a doctor. It's much more visionary, high high level talking rather than like this staff member we're having an issue with and I can't get her to do X. Like now that is just replaced with a phone call from with coach and person at the front office manager um, that they can, they can actually technically do that on the side where, you know, coaching calls are so much more high value and I can't, you know, I've had many coaching calls that are kind of derailed based on can't get the hygienist to do this. Can't get the front to do this. Like it's, it's a much better dynamic now with think of the workflow before. So when Matt and I were on a coaching call, and a client says, hey, my hygienist isn't reappointing patients effectively. We have to go through and teach them how to get their hygienist to reappoint effectively. Now on a call, one of our coaches can just write it down and say, all right, I'll talk to your office manager about that. Let's move on. Yeah. Do you see the difference? That, that's huge. Now, the coach is going to make sure that gets done, either through the office manager or directly through the hygienist, depending on their relationships with the team. But we don't waste that precious coaching call time on that stupid issue, 
we can talk about higher level functions that we only need the dentist for. Mm -hmm. Strategic moves, where we're going, where things are feeling, how's your stress level? What, what can I help you with? You know, all of those things. We can now use our coaching call much more effectively. It's much more efficient and we can accomplish a lot more and grow faster. It's, uh, it's, we've found so much benefit in switching to this model. And then the doctor to doctor component that they like from the doctor coaching them, we get in mastermind. They have that peer environment with their pod, their pod leader, all of those things where they can sort of bat around that real estate discussion about owning the building or not, you know, all of the personal finance stuff we talk about, doctor to doctor, all the those clinical conversations, stuff, materials, the, the clinical materials, the, all those conversations happen in mastermind in a group of doctors so we can find the best practice as a group. So we really feel like we're able to kind of give the complete package in this new format, which kind of resembles the new format of our show. Matt and I talk about the doctor-related items that would be discussed in Mastermind. And Suzanne talks about the coaching-related items that we worked on in the coaching relationship. And together, we're a complete package, but it needs both of us. The episode needs the intro, the interview, and the outro to be complete. Same thing with our coaching. That was well said. Awesome. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. And... um Again, our front office teams rock. And uh, we'll see you guys <laughs> next time on the Shared Practices Podcast.